So hi everyone, um, welcome to the science communication and public engagement during a global pandemic seminar. So it's my pleasure to introduce you Stuart Higgins. He is a biophysicist and an engineer investigating cell biomaterial interfaces and organic bioelectronic devices at Imperial College. He is not an epidemiologist, has no experience in pandemics, but he does produce an award-winning podcast, Scientists Not the Science, which explores the cultures of being a scientist. In 2019, he was a British Science Association Daphne Orm Award lecturer selected to present his research at the British Science Festival. He created Science in the Supermarket, an engagement project which aims to engage underrepresented young families in supermarket settings. He has produced content for the BBC Radio, The Naked Scientists radio show, and has been involved in numerous engagement activities. So let's welcome him, and Stuart, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. OK. Are we good? Can everyone see and hear me? Excellent. Wonderful stuff. So thank you so much, Francesca, for the introduction. It's an absolute pleasure to be able to talk to you today um, about topics that I, that I really care about, things that I'm really passionate about. And so when I was putting this together, uh, what this talk is going to be about is going to be about um, some of the projects I've been involved in, in the past and why I believe in public engagement, why I think it's so important. And I'm going to use that to set up what's been happening in the last eight to ten months in terms of other different projects around the country. And so obviously a lot of things have happened and a lot of things have changed. And I want to draw out um, not just where things have cancelled or where things have stopped, but how people have moved, how they've migrated and changed their behaviours in light of what's been happening. Uh, some positive behaviours and seeing how people have been able to adapt to the current situation. And then at the end, I want to kind of reflect just momentarily a little bit on the, almost the, the kind of uh, responsibility of scientists in this moment and how public engagement is so important and how maybe there are better ways of moving through that space and better ways of being careful about how we choose to communicate at the moment in particular. So a little bit about myself to begin with. Um, I've been affiliated with a number of different institutes. I currently work at Imperial College London. In the past I've worked in Cambridge. I also spent some time in Germany and my background is actually in electronics. So I made these flexible circuits, um, little bendable computer screens, effectively the technology behind that. Um, and I moved on and uh, retrained almost in bioengineering. And so using the same techniques that we use to make these little circuits, I had a go at making these tiny spiky surfaces. So this is an image looking down on a surface and each one of those needles is about a thousandth of the width of a human hair. And what we do with those tiny spike surfaces is we put cells on top of them and we look at what those cells do and it helps us understand what's something about the biology of those cells. Now, when I'm doing engagement, I don't normally show this picture. I show this one instead. Uh, I was very proud of this. This took me um, Quite a while to make. Uh, what you're looking at is a table covered in um, anti-climb spikes. These are designed to stop people climbing over fences and I spent a long time spray painting them with silver paint. And then we have these wonderful toys that I got online uh, of, a, I think, of a neuronal cells and hair follicles and fat cells and stem cells. And so this is an activity that I take out and about to try and engage, in this case, young families um, about uh, science subjects. And my purpose there is not so much to get them to understand particularly what I'm doing with my spiky surfaces, but it's about trying to encourage them to see the value in science and trying to encourage them to maybe to consider it as a career path in the future. So here's a, a, a whole slide of logos of projects I've been involved with. These are my credentials, basically. Why am I talking to you today? Um, and so all of all these different projects, in essence, actually most of them, if not all of them, have been completely affected by the pandemic. And in reality, a lot of that is to do with um, it, most of them rely on face to face interaction, which we no longer have. So at the start of this talk, I wanted to kind of reflect upon why I feel engagement is important and and what are the kind of themes that I feel uh, are, are important. Um, and this will kind of pivot into looking at how it's been affected by the pandemic. So for me, uh, one of the reasons why I love taking part in public engagement is to inspire and encourage. And so actually it depends a lot on which audience you're engaging. So when we talk about public engagement or we talk about science communication, 
we're talking about a lot of different things at once. And so which public you're choosing to engage matters. And so throughout this talk, I'll be talking about school kids, but I'll also be talking about adults or I'll be talking about other researchers as a public. So even public engagement with other researchers. Um, so for me in my own work, uh, I'm quite keen on inspiring, encouraging young people to consider STEM careers. And so um, I just want to kind of briefly introduce this project because um, I'm very passionate about it. This is a map of the United Kingdom and it is colour coded by data that shows participation in higher education. So um, what it means is that each of the colours represents how likely a young person is to go to university effectively or engage in higher education. And if you zoom into the southwest where I'm from and we flag my little town, you can see it sits in this little red zone. So actually, depending on where you're from in the country has a huge impact on whether you're going to be taking part in, in higher education. Um, and I just wanted to use this moment as a chance to kind of say um, things are very granular. When we consider public engagement, we have to think very carefully about who we're engaging and on what terms we're engaging them. And often a lot of efforts uh, are highly focused around cities, so around London in particular or around other areas, uh, big cities, because you have the universities already there. And so I'm just kind of using this moment to say, um, have a think about where your audience is and maybe thinking about which audience is most underserved by um, uh, most underserved by engagement efforts at the moment. So yes, you could of course go and do something in your local science museum, but that's already there. Maybe there are other places and people to find. Now what's been challenging in the, during the pandemic is actually it's impossible for me to go and visit that location. It's impossible for me to um, travel down across the country and go and find them in, in uh, find people in that location where I normally would. So part of this talk for me has actually been a kind of discovery process where I've been looking at what other ideas people have been doing and how they've been doing engagement uh, in different spaces so that I can get ideas for my own work as well. And if you're interested in that a little bit more, um, you can find out some uh, information at superscience.org.uk. We have a project report there, which is all about meeting people in supermarkets about third spaces. So as well as inspiring and encouraging people, uh, I think another big part of public engagement and science creation is just pure joy. Um, there's a lot of fascinating things out there in the universe and there's so much interesting stuff. Uh, and so as a quick example, when I was working on these bendy circuits and all of these uh, plastic electronics, the classic go to would be to say, uh, you know, when you're trying to communicate the idea would be to say something like Harry Potter. So in the Harry Potter movies, there is the Daily Prophet newspaper, and this newspaper is magical because it contains moving pictures. Now, what I love about science and what I love about the kind of endeavor of science is the fact that we can take something seemingly magical and make it real. So we can do this. We now see from you know commercialized space that we can make rollable and foldable TV screens. And we can also take, uh, you know, if we wanted to look like a newspaper, we could take maybe an e-ink technology as well. So it really does look like paper that moves. And then the final thing I think about engagement is I think about building trust in science. And this isn't, you know, these three ideas aren't completely exclusive. There are other reasons to do public engagement. These are the three I'm picking up for this talk. Um, but this idea of building trust, I'm going to come back to that at the end because actually that's where I feel like the pandemic has, uh, you know, there are things there we can think about. So if we think about now how the pandemic has impacted existing projects, well, it's been a lot of cancellations. So here's a little summary of what's been happening in the United Kingdom. I appreciate it's been different, different in different countries, um, but in the United Kingdom, we were had a, our first lockdown from the 26th of March to the 4th of July, and we're currently in the midst of a second lockdown from the 5th of November until the 2nd of December. And so that immediately placed a lot of constraints on freedom of movement. Um, What's interesting is on the right hand side of this slide is you can see a form of public engagement. You can see how the government chose to communicate those messages. Uh, so initially we had these slogans, stay home, protect the NHS, save lives. So there was a, a big focus on um, the reason for the lockdown being to prevent overcrowding of our hospital services. Uh, and that message has morphed over time. And there's a lot of interesting critique and kind of interesting discussion around how well placed that public engagement was. But if you're interested, I would recommend looking it up because there's some interesting ideas around how those ideas, uh, how those messages are conveyed. So everything that was face to face was cancelled. And so all of these events that uh, I'm used to, basically meeting people, engaging people, being in a room, uh, none of that's happening. And actually 
that's immediately very tough because actually if you're somebody who's used to doing that kind of stuff uh, and communicating with audiences um not having that face-to-face -face interaction is really tough even now as i'm speaking to you i can't see you i can't understand whether i'm boring you i can't understand whether this isn't interesting i can't see whether that's a bit you liked or not and so it's incredibly tough environment in which to kind of reach out to people especially if you're used to understanding your audience and seeing what your audience wants and what your audience needs and so in particular the festivals have been really affected so the imperial festivals the british science festivals the big bang fairs cambridge science festival all these events have been cancelled because they just simply weren't possible to do in person so what's interesting is thinking about how those face-to-face -face events have migrated into virtual spaces so not all of that has been possible and i wish to stress at this point that um it's okay that not everything was translated. This is an incredibly tough time. It's an incredibly tough time for everybody. And it's still an incredibly tough time for the engagement people as well, people who normally do engagement. And so um, I feel like if you're a scientist watching this and you've previously been involved in some engagement and now you're thinking, well, I've, oh God, I've done nothing in the last few months. That's okay, because actually it's a tough time. It's really difficult. And for the purpose of this talk, I spoke to a lot of my friends and colleagues who've uh, been doing a lot of engagement and the the general sense was that what's happening at the moment is this learning process people are slowly beginning to understand how they can act and they can respond to the current situation or rather the ongoing situation and how they can adapt their projects and it's okay that that's taken time and it's okay that that's a fuzzy process that's a little bit difficult at the moment now that said there have been some really nice uh, examples of where people have moved from a face-to-face -face environment into a virtual space so a lot of these are uh, Imperial centric. Uh, that's where I currently work. Um, but so uh, Imperial had cancelled its festival, but it did also have this program called Imperial Lates. And so the public that they're trying to reach here are adults. It's typically an over 18 style event. It's usually held in person uh, on the campus and it involves kind of, you know, come along and have a few drinks and engage with research and kind of pop up stands. And so they've been quite successful in moving their projects online. Um, Here's an example here where uh, it was a publish quiz. So you can't have your normal pub quiz, so you can do it at home. Um, and this was, I think, in the form of a, a YouTube live event. Uh, and so you have here, obviously, the, the quiz that you can engage with and you have your live chat. So people can at least feel engaged and feel part of a community and part of what's going on. What's also been interesting is how the constraints have forced new ways of thinking about projects. So, you know, how can we tackle this in a creative way? So I spoke with Dan Simpson and he is uh, the poet in residence at Imperial College London. So Dan was originally brought on to work on the Imperial Festival. Um, and when that was cancelled, he was forced to uh, reassess and re-engage how he was going to, uh, what he was going to do essentially. And so for him, uh, his background is, is combining science and poetry. And so he had a whole uh, has a whole ongoing project called Verse Research, which is about crowdsourcing different ideas and different words based on a theme from people on Twitter and using that to work together with a scientist to create poetry. Uh, and so you're starting to release this kind of stream of different uh, ideas and different uh, poems based on his engagement. Um, and so this is one example of where the constraint is you can't meet people you can't do in person okay so how else can you reach that audience in his case a kind of adult science interested audience uh, he's been doing that through social media we also have uh something called the invention rooms at imperial which is part of our white city campus so this is uh we have two campuses at the college one in the center of london one slightly more out of the the western side of the uh, of the capital and the area that that campus is in has a large number of families and when Imperial moved into that space it wanted to develop engagement opportunities to, to work with them and so one of the things it did was create this uh, this building or purchase this building um, that contains a cafe and it contains rooms and it contains spaces where the community can uh, on their doorstep come in and learn about science and learn about different activities and so this is what it would normally look like uh, during an activity and, and, and reaching out to people now, one of the huge problems then is, of course, none of this can now happen. So what they actually did, and I spoke with a couple of the uh, engagement professionals at Imperial who, who run this, is they then pivoted to seeing how can they reach that same audience, but at home. 
And so I'll mention a little bit later about some of the barriers that, that people face when engaging in virtual spaces. Um, but what they did here was quite proactive. So they turned these, this space into an assembly workshop where they could put together backpacks. And so inside each of these backpacks, there was a whole series of craft materials that would allow young people at home to do their own science experiments and do and kind of carry on the kind of same activities they've been doing in person before. And so here's a really nice example of where they've kind of quickly pivoted to a new idea to accommodate the restrictions. Now, what was really interesting is that uh, in the gap in between lockdown one and lockdown two, um, people were allowed back in with the proper social distancing in place. So as long as you had the kind of correct spacing, you were, were allowed, at least in the UK, to bring people back into some spaces. And an interesting side effect that they noticed uh, whilst doing that was that essentially each family was confined to a table with you know a big two meter ring around between the families. So the parents couldn't go wandering around. And what they've kind of anecdotally noticed is it's meant that the parents are now more engaged in the activity because they're kind of forced to sit there with their child. And so weirdly enough, the, the kind of restrictions of the, of, of the lockdown, restrictions, sorry, of the, of the pandemic have meant that they're actually reaching parents more at the moment through these activities, that the parents are more likely to be taking part in the activity, more likely to be talking to their child about the activity. So these kind of little quirky side effects that you see from the new constraints. And so it's also important to remember that not everything was cancelled because not everything was done face to face. And so there's a huge range of existing virtual spaces that were very well placed to accommodate the, uh, the changes. And so in particular, there's a scheme called I'm a scientist, get me out of here. And the idea here is that scientists can sign up and they're kind of put into groups about five or six and they are kind of competing against each other and they're competing for the attention and the votes of school children. So teachers can sign up their classes uh, and a class can do a group chat with the scientist. They can ask them questions uh, and they can also submit questions via our website for them to answer at their own pace. And it spans over two weeks. And so what's really nice about this is there is no face to face. They, there is no video chat per se. This is all done through a web interface. It's all moderated. Um, and so it's quite compatible with scientists working patterns. You know, you don't have to be committed to very long blocks of time. Um, and it also means you're getting to, again, reach schools that wouldn't otherwise uh, be reached. So further away from the capital, you don't need to be near them. Um, this is one of the chats I was involved in. Um, it's quite good fun. I would recommend it if you have the opportunity to take part. Um, there is moderation, but the moderator there's only one moderator and there might be 30 school pupils. So occasionally um, things get a little bit crazy. I was very happy. Annabelle said Stuart is a good scientist. You know, that's amazing. Thank you. Um, a lot of people were commenting on my eyebrows for most of the chat based on my photo. Um, hey, you know, you, you take what you can get, you know, at least they were interested in some way. Now, what was interesting about the I'm a Scientist project is that one of these uh, competitions was running as lockdown happened. And so there's quite a nice blog post about this on their website about what kind of questions they were getting. And so kind of almost immediately they were starting to have students asking questions about coronavirus and about COVID. And so I kind of cherry picked a few that I found interesting. So, that, you know, the kind of classic ones, when do you think we'll find a cure for the coronavirus? And then what I thought was interesting is that it gives you an insight into what the, the, the school pupils are thinking. You know, these are kind of uh, 14 to 16 year olds. Um, you know, is it still OK to harm animals to find a cure for the coronavirus? And then almost kind of going into the politics of it, you know, how are they solving the symptoms, the cures, and what do you think about the decision to keep schools open? So, you know, it's a reminder that that uh, in this moment that that you know students are still there, they're still engaged, they still have these questions, and they still want to um, have answers about this. Uh, and through these activities and engagement opportunities, there there's a chance to kind of um, maybe not answer all of them, you know, some of these are political in nature, but actually talk about how scientists are working in this space. And so there's also this idea that the barriers have changed and the barriers to entry have changed. What I mean by that is that in many ways, virtual spaces provide better access for those with caring responsibilities. So if you've got a family at home or if you've got uh, someone you're caring for, uh, that means that you wouldn't normally be able to take time away in the evenings or go over or travel to a different location to kind of take, in, take part of events. Then this virtual space is quite democratic. It's quite leveling. You can do that from almost anywhere. Quite a lot of people I spoke to mentioned that there was a certain um, confidence to engage that comes from a virtual environment. Now, a kind of polite way of saying that is we know what people write on the internet, uh, given half the chance. But actually, 
in a more serious setting, um, people who maybe otherwise wouldn't speak up are free to do so. In the same way for this talk today, you can put your questions into the chat and we can try and answer some at the end. You don't have to raise your voice. You don't have to physically uh, you know, put your hand up, um, but you can be still be part of, of that process and still be part of that dialogue. Uh, and the other area, and this is thinking more about public engagement in terms of things like researchers, um, there are lower financial barriers to access. And so what do I mean by that? Um, if you're trying to reach, let's say you're trying to reach a group of researchers, for example, you're doing some engagement with other scientists, then you don't have to charge a very high conference fee, for example. Now, if you're looking at uh, reaching some school children, um, you don't have to charge them entry to your museum. So I mentioned on the previous slide that actually that there can be some uh, barriers that are reduced by the pandemic. In this case, uh, you can have better access to those with caring responsibility. You can have this uh, confidence to engage and speak in the virtual environment that you wouldn't otherwise have. Um, and also that potentially you've got lower financial barriers. Sorry, bear with me one moment. I'm just checking my microphone is still working properly. Yep, I'm getting a thumbs up from the tech team. We're good. Now let's talk about barriers to communicating in public. Uh, let's talk about technological barriers, equipment barriers. So firstly, you have to assume that actually uh, people have got access to the equipment. Now, uh, that's not as simple as saying, does everyone have a smartphone? Does everyone have a tablet at home? Uh, some families won't have that access and that is something that needs to be considered. But even if a family does have, say, a smartphone or a tablet that their children could use to do a public engagement, uh, engage with a public engagement event, then is that tablet or phone going to be available for the time they need to do it? They need to see it. Is there only one device that the parents need in the evening to do some work on? And so these are the kind of barriers that can potentially emerge in this virtual environment. There's also this risk, and this is from conversations with various people, at risk of targeting high value groups. Now, what's meant by that is that if you're a museum that's really struggling financially, um, you might prioritise uh, the rich people to come back. I mean, people who've got money to buy the tickets because you need that money to survive. Uh, and that's a, a way of keeping your you know, survival and keeping your business open. So what's the cost of that in the process? Are you going to price out some people who might otherwise not be able to attend your, your, your system, to attend your museum? And amongst all of this, there's a risk of reinforcing existing barriers. So there are an awful lot of barriers to public engagement already. The kind of space you meet people in, where you meet them. I've talked a little bit about location being a huge barrier. Uh, and so we need to be very careful when we think about our activities, how to design them in a way that doesn't put these barriers up. I just wanted to highlight as well a couple of things. So these are public engagement efforts that are mainly focused on scientists. Um, but here's how they're being used to, in this case, um, improve the visibility of women in optics. So uh, one of my colleagues and friends, Jess Wade, has been hosting a seminar series online about uh, women in different research areas. Um, there are also areas such as Wikithons, which is editing Wikipedia. And so people have been using this space and using this additional virtual space that's been created by the pandemic in order to create spaces for them to further their cause and also to raise the profile of groups that are otherwise underrepresented. So there's great stuff that can be done in this moment. Similarly, the Wellcome Trust, which had been doing a whole big project in the UK about how to uh, reimagine research. So in this case, they wanted to find out, okay, what are all the problems with uh, academic research and science? And how can we improve those? Well, originally they were gonna go and reach researchers in person. They were gonna go around the country and visit people and they had to stop doing that. Now, what they found was, again, because they were moving to this virtual environment, um, they're able to engage people and reach larger numbers that they wouldn't have reached before because there's a lower barrier. If you, you know committing to go to a webinar is much different to committing to traveling to a location. And that also they were hearing voices that you wouldn't normally otherwise hear. So I'm getting towards the end, but the final thing I wanted to touch on was this idea of building trust in science. And there's kind of three ideas here. So in this moment, in this pandemic, we see that science is being very much aligned with politics. It depends a little bit on which country you're in. But for example, in the UK, when the pandemic started, you'd see this on your TV screens every evening. That's the Prime Minister Boris Johnson, flanked by the Chief Medical Officer and the Chief Scientific Officer, two professors, physicians. And so it was quite a fascinating thing as a scientist to observe because you saw um, a wall of science being presented. Science is going to save us from this pandemic. So in this moment of extreme pressure, extreme tension and extreme anxiety amongst all of us, um, we were being messaged and told that science was going to help us and save us. 
Here are some tweets I put in Imperial College into Twitter, and these have appeared in the last 24 hours. Now, I'm not going to go into any detail here. I haven't properly looked these all up or anything. My point of this slide is to say that with that alignment comes responsibility and with that alignment comes risk. So in particular, in the United Kingdom, Imperial College has been hugely linked to the pandemic response. Uh, a lot of the mathematical modelling that was used to dictate the lockdown, the first and second modelling, uh, second lockdown came out of Imperial. Uh, we're doing you know, a lot of work on vaccine development, even colleagues I know are working on vaccines and on diagnostic tests. Um, and so while this is maybe not, this is a very cherry picked example, maybe not representative of the, of the entire view of things, it's an understanding that when you start prefixing huge um, changes and interventions on people's lives with the phrase scientists say, or scientists say we should do this and this, then it's presenting a certain image of science and it's presenting a certain responsibility. And so it's very important that as we navigate that space, we're transparent and open about what science is and what it's trying to do. So in particular, I found the words of uh, Catherine Matheson, who's the chief executive of the British Science Association, very uh, helpful on this, uh, this topic. And so they did some polling, the British Science Association, a charity uh, in the UK, that showed about uh, trust dipping in confidence during the first lockdown. And again, potentially, you know, not too sure why, but kind of linked to this idea of presenting science as uh, it's going to have the answer. Whereas actually what science is about is it's about um, recognising what we don't know and understanding that it's a process and understanding that ideas are going to evolve. And so early on, in particular in the UK's response, you saw a lot of statements that kind of were very strong and affirmative that then had to be walked back. They weren't kind of saying something that wasn't necessarily true all of the time. And so changes in policy. And so those kinds of shifts kind of start to question, well, what authority does science have in this moment? And so the point I'm making here is it's about responsibility. And I particularly liked uh, some points that she made in a blog post on the website, which will talk about listen before talking. So make sure you're listening to your audience as you're engaging them. This shift in understanding of what science is. Science is a process. It's about discovery. It's not an absolute knowledge. It's not an absolute this is the right answer. Uh, and again, kind of reflecting on this idea of a better representation in this moment. What can we do to improve the representation of the audiences we reach and of the science itself? I don't have any examples of this, but it's uh, a little bit in came up in conversations and I've read it in a few articles. Um, I had to learn the word for this, this is some jargon. Epistemic, I think it's pronounced epistemic, I'm not entirely sure. Epistemic trespass. Basically, scientists who don't know what they're talking about, talking about stuff online. So again, I'm not going to go there in terms of any examples or anything because there's no way I'm saying that in public. But there is essentially, you know, you've got to be very careful just because you are a scientist in one field doesn't necessarily mean you have the first clue about coronavirus or about pandemics. And again, this is all about this idea of responsibility. What's safe to share? What are we thinking about when we're when we're saying comments and doing commentary? Are we qualified to say those comments? Um, and it's a bit of a grey area. You know, it is fuzzy. It's hard to know what we know and, and what we don't know. And, and, you know, there are definitely examples of people with non research expertise who are very good communicators or very good at sharing those ideas and are effective at communicating responsibly. But it's just to say kind of we just need to be aware of what's happening. And again, my final point that I'm making is this idea of posting ethically. So um, making sure that when as scientists we're, we're engaging online, engaging about debates around the pandemic, that we're doing that in a responsible way. Uh, so a couple of interesting things that happened. Uh, Twitter at the start of the pandemic started verifying epidemiologists. So this is this little blue tick that people get against their name and that's a big deal. If you're verified on Twitter, you know, people tend to give you, uh, uh, give you give you more views, you'll get more uh, response of, of people to your posts. And so they were doing a system where they were trying to verify uh, different epidemi epidemiologists online. And then the other thing I wanted to end with is actually uh, a colleague, uh, Dr. Anna Blackney, who is a joint student with uh, the group I work with and a, another professor at Imperial, where they're working on the vaccine development. And this is a really beautiful example of how public engagement can work during a pandemic. So um, this is where I got out of my comfort zone. This is TikTok. I'm not really going to pretend to understand what TikTok is. I, it's an app and young people use it. And they it's like little videos, little clips and videos, usually set to music, to pop music. And uh, you can kind of speak to the camera and you can do sharp editing and you can put little floating images and stuff around on the surface. It's a form of social media interaction. It's a way of communicating to people. And so what Anna's been doing in her work is been 
very much filming in the lab, showing people what RNA vaccine research looks like. So this is a shot of uh, uh, one of the, um, the heater systems. And so it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting way of engaging. Uh, and this is getting some serious views. I think, you know, we're talking millions and millions of people engaging with these kind of posts. There's two and a half million likes here. I think I reached 10 million people watching some of these videos. So here's a really great example of where creative use of a new media, in particular, going to meet people on the, in the, in the location where they are. So what I mean by that, in my work, I'm interested in going to supermarkets, yeah, because that's where I'm going to find the families. It's going to be a fair location. Um, if you want to communicate your ideas about the vaccine to young people, you can go find them in their in their space. Don't ask them to come to you. Don't expect them to come into your event or to come into your you know place of work. You can go and find them. You can go and meet them in that location. It's a really nice example. So let's summarize my points on this, and then I'm happy to kind of end and take questions. So feel free to start thinking about them and putting them in the chat if you haven't already done so. And so what I've been talking about is this idea that obviously public engagement and science communication is vital. I'm going to say that I do loads of it, but it is. And in this moment, we've really seen how that plays out in the last eight months in terms of the lockdown. Now, all the face to face events have been cancelled and they've been replaced by these virtual spaces. And some virtual spaces were already there and are being used really well. And what we've seen is a, a combination of existing and new barriers. So there are always a lot of barriers to science communication and public engagement already, and they're still there. They just got a little, maybe a little bit more hidden by what's going on. And there are also these new barriers potentially in terms of who's got access and who you're reaching. And what that means is there's a responsibility to think about who we're getting, who we're going to reach and how we're going to do it. But in this moment, there's so much creativity. There are so many brilliant ideas that have come out of this process and people come up with new ways of engaging and new ideas. And what I found really interesting in talking to people was that they don't want to change. When I talk to the public engagement team at Imperial, they don't necessarily want to revert back to life as normal, whatever that means. So when this is over, or as this moves on, I should say, they're thinking about, okay, how can they combine these new ideas, these ideas that have worked well for them, and take them forward with them? And the final point I made was this need to responsibly engage and understand the needs of our audience. So being responsible about what we post to scientists, being responsible about uh, how we say things, but also our responsibility to listen first before we start talking. Uh, and with that, I'm going to uh, just acknowledge uh, a whole lot of people who were very helpful in, in my kind of research this episode, uh, people from Imperial, from the Wellcome Trust, from different charities and organisations uh, whose conversations were the basis for this talk. Uh, and I'm going to leave you with an advert, of course, for my podcast, because how, how could I not? Uh, it's uh, it's a meta podcast. We don't talk about science. We talk about the process of the, the enterprise of science. It's about the culture. And I talk to scientists and a lot of engagement specialists. So if you're interested in public engagement, you can you can listen to a lot of uh, interviews with people there, but also people like editors, journalists, broadcasters and even comedians. Uh, and you can find it at signupside.com. And with that, I'm going to say thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. And stick around because we're going to have some questions. And I'm going to hand you back to Francesca. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Stuart, for your talk. Uh, that was uh, great, uh, really interesting. Uh, and I think uh, you gave uh, a lot of uh, uh, inspiring uh, information uh, and view uh, for both scientists and science uh, communicators. So it's uh, it was very interesting in these uh, uh, pandemic times. Uh, we have a couple of questions. Uh, by the way, I'm Giuliano Greco from uh, um, Communication and External Relations uh, Office of uh, IIT. So uh, uh, just to say hi to everybody, to, to the people that are um, following the seminar. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through the questions. Uh, uh, so the first question is from Nikita. Uh, she's asking, uh, with school going completely virtual, uh, what are good alternatives to science lab practicals? Is virtual or augmented reality an option? What do you think, Stuart? Uh, yeah, so I think it depends. I think it depends on what you're what you're trying to achieve. Um, so I, I, you know, there are a lot of really good practical um, low tech solutions out there already. And so I'm, I, I'm not convinced necessarily that you need to have a particularly high tech response or a high tech intervention. Now, obviously, as tools improve and as people get smartphones that can do augmented reality uh, and, and different things, then yeah, that's great. Let's do it. And, you know, if you've got 
kids have got access to virtual reality headsets on their PlayStations or whatever, then you know that's always going to be a space that we can move into. But I think at the moment, because that adoption rate is quite low and because there aren't, isn't that much of technology around, um, the most effective results are going to be um, simpler, more cost effective interventions that reach more people. So and again, like how do we know which ones those are? Well, we can ask. And so, you know, I'd always say, like, ask schools what they need. Schools will tell you what they need. Um, they may not need certain kits. They may not need certain resources. What they might need is certain information about a topic. Uh, and so in that case, the best people to ask are the schools themselves because they know their pupils the best. Yeah, I think, uh, thanks, uh, Stuart. Yes, I, uh, I think that yeah, yeah, we, we have to start from needs, uh, from school needs and, and build something uh, proper um, to uh, to communicate with uh, with that age. And I think that one of the main problems uh, uh, with school age is uh, uh, to find uh, activities that are virtual or anyway with implying a, a large use of technology but uh, where actually the uh, kids uh, can focus really focus but that's that's I think it's a uh, is a big issue to uh, try to attract the really really attract the attention the attention of that uh, of that age uh, anyway, we go through the second uh, question. Um, do you think uh, scientists should, should receive more formal training on public engagement or maybe should scientists uh, train communicators and journalists? That's a good question. <laughs> that is a that's a great question and, and thank you um, to both of you for the questions uh, so far. It's been it's really interesting to think about these. So um, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm a big fan of training. I love training courses. I think everyone should get trained in everything. Um, there is, you know, there's a, a real danger in science that we assume a scientist is just good at public engagement or that it's just enough to put them in front of an audience. Nah, that's really bad idea. Uh, that's a good way of putting off a lot of kids a lot of the time. Um, so, yeah, I definitely big fan of, of more formal training and um, recognizing that there is, you know, the public engagement um, uh, professional community. So people who are professional public, engage, uh, public engagement specialists is there. There are amazing people out there doing amazing work. And at the moment, because in particular, because a lot of them are freelance, this will be a great time to start, you know, employing them and starting, uh, in, you know, bringing them on board to help with those projects, and especially if universities, you know, can start doing that. Um, and in terms of um, should scientists train communicators or journalists? Uh, yeah, yeah, God, both ways. I mean, there are a couple of examples. I'm trying to think off the top of my head where there are some schemes that do that already. So um, there are in the UK at least media fellowships. So where scientists go into news organisations uh, for you know a period of six weeks. There are even schemes that put scientists into parliament and pair them up with members of parliament for, for the similar kind of duration. And so uh, again, that's great because it's it's that mutual understanding. It's about understanding, OK, well, in the media environment, here are the priorities uh, and here's what actually matters. And actually, as a scientist, here are our priorities and seeing where those two meet. So, yeah, definitely agree to both those points. And uh, I think that I can add also our uh, IIT view of the thing as a communication office. We uh, we do uh, train uh, scientists uh, uh, in, in media, like we, we, we do media training for scientists. Uh, so uh, our office, uh, uh, we are, mm, most of them are have a background, a scientific background, but then we trained in communication for many years and now we, we train scientists uh, uh, and we try to uh, teach scientists how they can relate with media and general public. And uh, on, on the other hand, we organize also courses for journalists with our scientists to train journalists on the topics uh, more you know the trending topics uh, in, in science so uh, I think that every uh, like both things are, are, are absolutely necessary uh, Mariangela is uh, uh, is making another question can citizen science project from home uh, for example zoo universe but I don't know um, also be considered as crucial in engaging public and increase trust in science in times like the current one how we uh, how can we more effectively more effectively adver advertise them okay um okay so yeah uh if i i'm not 100 percent finished so zooniverse is a i think a website 
where anyone can log on and create an account and you can classify telescope images of galaxies. You can say that's a spiral galaxy or that's a different kind of galaxy. And so the idea there is that obviously you need um, human eyes are better at kind of distinguishing these things than computers are. Um, and so a better idea of advertising those schemes. Yeah, I think it's generally my answers to these questions are a little bit of everything helps. So, I, I, you know, I wouldn't say, oh, everything should be citizen science because that that's not possible. But where where, you know, you can do citizen science and where you can engage people with your research, then yeah, definitely. That is that is a, a really good thing. And it's, a um, you know, in terms of things like trust and building trust, um, you often want to think about what what activity is going to impact someone's lives actually meaningfully. And so, again, you know, um, if you're trying to reach a certain audience or you're trying to build a relationship with an audience, then, you know, look at their local area. What issues might affect them that, that science is involved in? You know, is there, um, I think examples in the past have been things like, you know, certain areas with like uh, uh, ground contamination. There've been some, some engineering projects and there was some work to try and decontaminate some ground. So there's chemistry involved, there's different ideas involved. So if you can link your activities uh, to the local people and to their local environments and the things that they actually care about, then that's a great way of building trust and a great way of designing your project. So yes, I think these, these projects are, are really useful, not exclusively, um, the, but in combination with other things. And uh, yeah, they're a great way of building trust. Okay, next question uh, is uh, from uh, an anonymous uh, uh, follower and uh, it's a one million pounds or euros uh, question. Uh, he's saying that in my view, um, one of the main problem of the current times uh, is that people are not so comfortable in thinking um, following a, a scientific methodology. Uh, behind the communication of uh, what science uh, uh, does in terms of discoveries, uh, etc., how do you think we can improve, improve this attitude? Yeah, that is that really is the the million euro question. Yeah. Um, how can you? Yeah, I mean that kind of goes back to kind of I think education and kind of. Uh, how we teach critical reasoning and whether we're giving schools the resources and the time to do that properly. Um, you know, arguably we can, we, you know, each country sets its own priorities about what it wants in its education system and making sure that that uh, understanding of the scientific process uh, and, and explicitly teaching it is a, is a really important part and it doesn't necessarily happen because of the constraints of, of uh, time, money and exams you know the exams in the uk are a big part of what gets taught there are some really nice examples of that um i uh spoke with uh, a long time ago with uh, uh, carol kenrick who was a, a science teacher and a scientist in a school and so she basically ran her own science lab within the school environment and so as kids came into the classroom they were scientists and they were you know i don't mean like just told oh you're a scientist in a kind of fake way they were considered scientists they did research and so through ideas like that and schemes like that, um, where you give young people agency to be a scientist, to take part in the scientific process, to really discuss and think about it, then yeah, you can help instill that sense of thinking. Um, I don't know how you retroactively do that with older people. Um, we all tend to get a bit stubborn, don't we, as we get older? Um, so I'm open to suggestions on that one. But, you know, yeah, it's definitely uh, uh, an important thing. And I think, you know, Starting with young people is a, is a good place to start. Mm. I think we might be still muted there. I think we've got a muted microphone, just bear with us one moment. Can you hear me now? Yes. OK, sorry. Um, I, I was saying that I have a question for you, but in the meantime, if uh, other people from the audience uh, um, would like to ask more questions to Stuart, uh, feel free to uh, add questions in the uh, Q&A uh, section. I do have a question. OK, you, you want to do the question before me? Go for it. 
<laughs> because it's a silly question, you know, so uh, I'd rather make it now and not close it with that one. <laughs> um, so we were talking about uh, like uh, engaging with social and you bring up this uh, example of this girl on uh, on TikTok, right? So I usually use like uh, Instagram and I'm one of those uh, still using Facebook and obviously Twitter for science related things that makes like a really good job. So my question is, am I not too old for engaging people on TikTok? <laughs> yeah, uh, I <laughs> no is the answer. Um, so that, that was that, I should say that woman Anna Blackney was uh, is a scientist at Imperial. So her job is to basically do the scientific do the, the do the vaccine research. Um, I don't think anyone's too old to do anything if you're willing to learn and willing to engage and uh, willing to um, take the time to learn about that audience and learn about that space. Don't go marching in and applying the same logic uh, that you have for existing engagement projects or existing scientific presentations to a space like that. That's going to be a disaster, but maybe actually being in that space for a while, learning what it's about, learning the rules of that space. Uh, the first time I ever used Twitter, I tweeted something by accident because I was searching and I put it in the in the Twitter bar rather than the search bar, you know, and like not understanding that if you put a full stop at the start of the Twitter. Anyway, so, you know, it, it takes time to learn these spaces. And if you're willing to do that and you're willing to put the time in, I don't think there's any age barrier there at all. OK, so I don't need necessarily to learn how to dance before approaching TikTok science related things. <laughs> I mean, maybe, 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 I don't know. Could I don't be know. Nice Who knows? <laughs> Thank you. Francesca, we can we can think about a project a dissemination of some of your projects on TikTok <laughs> in the future. Don't worry. Yeah. Uh, OK, I, I have a, I have a question for for Stuart as well. Uh, so uh, you wrote uh, about a year ago on Natural Materials, uh, a very interesting article uh, about um, titled Understanding Scientists is Key for Science. Um, I mean, in this article, you give uh, your uh, point of view as a scientist, but also as a podcaster, as a producer of uh, uh, scientific content for general audience. And uh, uh, you're mentioning in that article uh, um, different things that you learned uh, uh, during the interviews uh, uh, of the scientists uh, uh, while recording your podcast. Um, and you talk about uh, uh, opportunity cost, like when you you're doing something, uh, uh, you you you're not doing something else. So basically, uh, as a scientist, you have to decide very carefully uh, what um, where you have to spend more time um, in order not to waste your time. And uh, I know that uh, uh, many uh, many scientists think that. Uh, public engagement sometimes can be a waste of time for their research. What do you think about it? So it, it's it's really uh, it's really difficult because you do have to be really careful because ultimately at the end of the day, uh, my public engagement isn't going to be the main reason I get my next job. Uh, publishing papers is going to be what I get my next job. Uh, and so that you know, there's a whole conversation there about incentives in the system and how you incentivize uh, different people. Um, there's a different conversation for a different day. But um, what's my train of thought quickly? Bear with me. Yeah, so you've got to um, mind blank. Bear with me. This is this is the consequence of a lack of sleep from a small child. This is, <laughs> this is a work. Bear with me here. To ask your question again because it's completely blank. I've completely blanked it. It was about uh, the, the, the the opportunity cost of our science yeah, communication yeah. engagement. The cost and uh, uh, the fact that um, some scientists think that uh, uh, you know m m public engagement activity are a waste right. of time. So yeah. we have to balance uh, um, to, to choose carefully carefully where to uh, invest more time and public yeah. engagement. Uh, sometimes for them, it's uh, is the wrong place to invest time. Yeah, and, and so starting with that, not all scientists should do public engagement, is my opinion. Uh, there are some people who that's not the right environment for them to do things, and that's absolutely fine. And you can go through being a scientist and not doing public engagement. I'm OK with that. Um, I'd rather that we didn't have uh, people doing bad public engagement, you know. But I would say if you are of that viewpoint, um, there's a lot of nuance in what public engagement is. 
and that's kind of what I've been trying to say through the presentation that there's there are lots of different ways of considering there are lots of different publics that be different kinds of people and different groups of people you're reaching and there are lots of different ways of doing it and so um, think about what's useful think about what might help you in your research so you know what's a, what would a meaningful dialogue talk about so in my work at the moment I'm looking at the early detection of cancer uh, breast cancer in particular and so what I don't know as a scientist is I don't know what it's like uh, as a as a person who's been recently diagnosed with breast cancer I don't know what the diagnosis process is I don't know what um, what feelings I'm going to have I don't know what support I'm going to have so for me what I'm looking at at the moment is how can I engage do a form of public engagement to talk to people who can help me with that process now why does that matter well because I don't want to research something that's useless at the end of the day I have no interest in in spending my time doing research that that doesn't have some potential value and so if I don't engage and I don't talk to say patients or I don't talk to say clinicians there's a real risk that I'm going to design something and it's going to be wonderful and maybe I'll get a nice nature paper at it and make some nice photos and I can get a nice job in my career and become a professor but maybe there's some key elements of that that doesn't work in the real world that actually if you know a hospital environment you know that's never going to happen so that's where the real power of engagement comes in you look to your audience you see how they can help you it's this this dialogue it's this push and pull between uh, different parties and that's how you can improve your science and there are some no, nice examples of that um, that's where I think the real power of engagement lies now not all science fits neatly into that some science is fundamental and that's okay as well and then maybe it's about uh, inspiring people but you know you should always be able to explain to somebody as a scientist why you're doing what you're doing if you can't say why you're doing what you're doing there's a problem and even if that answer is because it's beautiful because it's amazing because it's magic that's okay but you should be able to answer that question and engagement is a way of forcing you to answer that question very good Aslan. thank you okay we go through another question um Anna asked us, um, uh, I've noticed that school students are more confident asking questions in the chat of online talks. How can we keep this confidence boosting format when we go back to face to face engagement? Good question. Mm, hi Anna, uh, thanks for that question. Um, I think that's a, a really good point because you can definitely see when you go into a classroom and you know you talk to any teacher and you know a good teacher will be able to handle this but if you're not used to that environment you'll see maybe one one pupil dominating the conversation and taking over maybe we don't have to go back to face-to-face -to -face engagement maybe we maintain those spaces that allow quieter students to still talk i mean i'm a scientist an example of that that's going to keep going after this and so maybe that's one way of doing that we we keep making sure that we we fund and support those activities that give that additional space to quieter students um i don't know how to translate it into the classroom i'm not i'm not i don't have enough uh teaching expertise to be able to answer i don't have any teaching expertise to answer that question but um i'm thinking maybe keeping the virtual spaces there as well which is what i'm hearing when i talk to people uh, you know in the process uh anyway i can add that <clears throat> there are some uh, applications that uh, uh, you can use also in, in uh, uh, you know, face-to-face -face events that involve the use of smartphones, smartphones or tablets, then you can uh, have uh, interact directly also with a big groups of, uh, of people. Uh, so that could be one uh, instrument that uh, uh, can be used also uh, when you have an audience that uh, like students uh, um, don't they don't feel when when they don't feel like to uh, participate uh, um, like uh, actively when are face to face when uh, when uh, they have in, they are in presence. Anyway, we go through another uh, question. Um, sometimes within the uh, audience uh, there are people that refuse scientific uh, scientific evidence and things are exacerbated by this pandemic. How do you deal effectively with this kind of people? But we'll listen to no reason without ending up in a sterile parties battle. <laughs> oh, these are great questions. Um, thank Back. you so much. <laughs> yeah, thank you for these. Um, and I just want to say, actually, uh, Anna, who asked the last question, is an amazing public engagement person, and you should Google her and, and find out about the work she's doing. And in, partic in particular, find her podcast, um, uh, Handmade, all about materials and different material sciences. Uh, really, really great. Um, so, in terms of people who refuse scientific evidence, um, 
I mean, pick your battles, right? I, I mean, you're not gonna, if you have somebody who's that strongly opinionated and, you know, is 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 trolling people on social media and, and kind of getting engaged, you're not gonna convince them otherwise, right? You're not gonna change that person's mind. Um, so maybe they're the wrong person to focus on. Uh, maybe you're actually focusing on the people sitting quietly in the background who are watching all of this play out. So, you know, what information are you presenting? What information are you sharing that that actually allows people to come to a judgment that actually this person who is refusing the scientific evidence, um, their views may not be valid or they may not be, you, you know, they, they may not have the right answer in this case. So how are you reaching the other people around them? Uh, and what information are you presenting to make the argument in, a, in an effective way? I think that's probably the best way of doing it because otherwise you just end up yelling at people on Twitter and that's that's not going to help anybody. Yeah, really bad. Uh, I think we have the last question because uh, uh, yes, from you know, the, the boss is saying yes, this is the last question. Um, Francesco Rizzi asks us, uh, do you think philosophy can have a part in education for scientific communicators? Uh, now that is, that is a, um, that's a good question. I, it's hard to unpack because it's hard to, I don't necessarily know what philosophy means in this concept. Con, uh, maybe I mean like the discipline of philosophy is in like philosophers working in academic environments. Um, yeah, I'm always, uh, generally, my principle is I'm always keen to uh, reach out to other disciplines and take insight from other disciplines. So, um, you know, there is a lot of people, a lot of researchers who study public engagement and study scientific communication in universities that, you know, these are uh, topics I recommend looking at the work of Dr. Emily Dawson, for example, at, at UCL. Um, so be it experts in other fields can definitely uh, in such as philosophy as well, might be able to give us information to understand what's happening. Um, in particular, in the past, I've seen uh, interactions with like psychology can really help understand things like imposter syndrome or understand how to reach audiences or, or the impact of role models. So again, Professor Michelle Ryan at the University of Exeter does, does some very nice work on, on role models. And so if you're thinking about how do I inspire young people, um, those domains and those specialisms can give you um, a framework so how to how to approach that problem. OK, so what should a role model look like when I'm putting a scientist in front of a class of students? Uh, how do we want to structure that in a way that's useful for them and makes that an effective role model? So, yeah, I, I definitely other domains, and other other subjects can definitely, um, uh, you know, be part of this process and should be. I completely agree and uh, actually I have to say that uh, probably most of the best science communicator that I know are very wide culture going from scientific discipline to literature, philosophy and arts and so uh, wider is the culture, better is the communicator from my point of view. Okay, uh, thank you everyone. I um, pass the floor to Francesca for the closing remarks and thank you everybody and uh, thank to you Stuart. Okay, so let me thank Stuart again for the very inspiring talk today and the discussion afterwards really was really amazing. Um, so before like closing everything, let's also thank the offices and the people behind these events, right? The ICT and the Research Organization Office, HR Communication Office, who try to keep us engaged. And so for this, they have prepared another couple of very interesting, exciting webinars, which you can see online now. So if you're lazy like me to add into your calendar, you can actually scan the QR code. So they make everything as easy as possible for us to keep this in mind. And so the next one is on November 25th at 4 p.m. on the social isolation and its impact on the human brain. Pretty cool. And then we have on December 9th at 4 p.m. this political epistemology of pandemic management. So people, thank you for your participation. It's been a very exciting discussion and um, I hope I'll, uh, I'll see you soon. Bye bye.